Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 2 of the History Archive. Last week we talked about the beginnings of underwater warfare and today we are going to be talking about nuclear submarines or more precisely the USS Nautilus and how she changed warfare and especially naval warfare forever. And as always in these episodes, I want to recommend a book before we begin, in which you can read on, or where you can read further on the theme. And today I want to give you Ice Diaries, written by Captain William R. Anderson. We will talk about him very extensively today, and he co-authored it with Don Keith a thriller author from the United States. This is no advertisement in the classical sense, I am just giving you my opinion on a book. Okay, so we are going to be starting and for those of you who did not listen to episode one, I'm going to give you a quick recap of what I said in the last few minutes of that episode because we were talking about um, German submarines and how they were refueled at sea during World War II. Um, for in fact, the Germans built a special kind of submarine. They called it the Milk Cow, um, or more technically termed, it is the Type 16 submarine. And it was basically a submarine like those that preceded her, a, a normal attack submarine in essence, only that it had much larger fuel tanks and it carried no weapons that she could fire herself. She only carried torpedoes to replenish the stock of other submarines. So she was basically a refueling ship. Ten of these were built in total and all ten were sunk by 1943. Uh, the Germans in fact did have plans to build a second class very similar uh, this class never came to existence and the reason for the, all those 10 submarines being destroyed was mainly because all the meeting points with other submarines were prearranged. So the Enigma was always used to communicate between the headquarter and the attack submarine and also the milk cow. So after the Brits or the Allies in general, cracked the encryption on the Enigma, they knew where these rendezvous were going to take place. So they knew where the milk cow and the attack submarine were going to meet. And because neither submarine could dive during refueling, which took several hours, the Allies had a decisive advantage and could always send a bomber to attack. And even though the uh, milk cow and most attack submarines were armed with 20mm flak guns. This did not always stop an attack. So after World War II, it was pretty clear to the Americans that they needed a submarine that could stay submerged for north of 70 days. Today nuclear submarines stay submerged for around about 72 days, which is around about two and a half months and in the day pre-nuclear submarines a submarine could stay under the waves maybe for 24 hours and then it would have to come up and recharge its batteries with its diesel engines. Late World War II the Germans developed a submarine I believe it was in 1945 that could stay submerged for longer, it only always had to come to snorkel depth because it had a snorkel so it could drive on its diesel engines at around about 10 meters depth. So the Americans weren't satisfied with this either because the submarine would still be running on diesel. So it would still have to refuel at some point in time and as we saw the milk cow was a dramatic failure. So the Americans wanted a submarine that could really stay submerged. 
There was always this idea at the back of their minds, probably, that one could also launch a nuclear missile from one of these things, if it could stay hidden. That would give a very good second strike capability, but we're going to be talking about that later. So the Americans started um, a project to build a nuclear submarine. To that point, most scientists had been building on the Manhattan Project. So the Manhattan Project had been designing uh, Fat Man and Little Boy, the two atomic bombs that had been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, sealing the end of World War II. And to that point, most focus had been laid on atomic power as a destructive weapon. But pre-World War II, there had been experiments to split the uranium atom to generate energy. And this experiment had been enough to drive a small light bulb. So nobody really knew if it was a good idea to dump one of these highly experimental nuclear reactors into a steel tube that would travel for north of 70 days under the waves. So a great innovation driver in this respect was Hyman Rickover, or more Admiral Hyman Rickover. He had been a submariner in World War II for the Americans and at his admiral status, he was the chief of the Naval Bureau of Ships. But he was also the head of the Naval Reactor Branch, or short NRB. This was a subdivision of the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission. And the Atomic Energy Commission at the time was the go-to place if you wanted to do anything with atomic power. So if you wanted to build a nuclear reactor, um, especially for the military, you were going to have to get past the Atomic Energy Commission because they were going to commission every nuclear reactor. So this, at the time, was a huge bureaucracy machine. And that was going to kill the drive of innovation. So Rickover somehow managed to convince AEC to make him a subdivision of the AEC. And so came the NRB, the Naval Reactor Branch we were just talking about. So he was on the one hand the chief of the Navy's shipbuilding division. And on the other hand he was the chief of a subdivision of the Atomic Energy Commission. That means that he could basically send memos to himself about the nuclear power project on the submarine. So he was on the one side he was the chief of the project of building the ship itself, on the other side he was also the, ch the chief of building the nuclear reactor. This of course sped up the production process and that also means that the ship was far, far, far quicker in development and production than it would have been if he would have just only been the chief of the Naval Bureau of Ships. Now this sounds as if Hyman Rickover was just a pure innovation driver and he didn't care about safety because he basically bypassed the safety division which was the AC, their chief concern or their chief job was to make sure that everything on the new nuclear power systems being in development at the time were safe. Rickover demanded absolute security for the sailors on the nuclear submarines he was developing. And in fact, his submarines were so safe that a sailor on the Nautilus was exposed to less radioactive radiation than a sailor on a surface ship. That's crazy thinking about that a sailor on the Nautilus would be only a few yards away from a nuclear power plant wherever he was on the ship. So 
the in the reactor was extremely 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 safe and there's a small anecdote that I would like to tell you about which illustrates how important security was for Admiral Rickover because during a meeting between two contractors on how to seal the top of the reactor there was a debate between a manufacturer who was going to weld the top of the um, reactor shut so the plate that goes on top of the reactor and there was a contractor who was going to manufacture a gasket so the meeting went on for a couple of hours and Mr. Rickover stepped in at the end of the meeting and he asked the representative of the gasket production contractor whether he would feel at ease if he knew that his son would be on the submarine in question. The man, according to the accounts I could find in the book I recommended, held silence for a few moments and then he said that it would be much safer to weld the cover because his argumentation had been that it would be cheaper and easier to refuel the reactor core because even though the nuclear submarine would travel for 70 days plus the core of the reactor would have to be exchanged every few years these days it isn't necessary anymore these days a submarine never needs to be refueled um, the reactor or the reactor core holds as long as the hull of the submarine itself but in the day it was necessary to actually refuel the reactor now and then. So Rickover demanded absolute safety for his submarines and it wasn't important how much the submarine would cost. It was far more important that the submarine was safe. Rickover was a challenging personality though. He always wanted to work with the smartest and the most intelligent people he could find and this was not always a very comfortable position to be in if you were one of those people that Rick Over worked with and in this respect I would like to tell you another story about the author of the book I presented to you Captain William Anderson because when he also a former World War II submarine commander inter was interviewed for a job at the naval reactor branch where Rickover was the boss. He had an order to appear at the early evening, in the early evening. So on the day before the interview was to take place, Anderson received a call from the secretary of Rickover telling him to come in the early afternoon so Anderson came to the office when he the caller had told him but he sat there until the point in time that he'd actually been ordered to in the first place so he sat there for several hours that alone was quite challenging for somebody on the edge of his seat waiting for a new job. And then Rickover ordered him in. And the first question Rickover asked Anderson was to name all the books he had read in the past two years disregarding old books in the past six months because he would have known about the interview that would be taking place and give a one sentence summary of each book. Anderson's mind seemingly was entirely blank at that moment and he couldn't name a single book. And Rickover had him shown out of his office at that moment. So Anderson went home and then Eventually, he decided to send in a list of the books he had read in the past two years, disregarding the books of the last six months he had read, with a short summary of each 
And for some reason, we don't know if this letter turned Rick over his mind, Anderson found himself at the nuclear reactor branch and in a job where he was teaching aspiring naval officers on submarines about nuclear reactors. And the first skipper, or the first commanding officer, of the USS Nautilus had been Eugene Wilkinson. Eugene Wilkinson had been the first commanding officer of the Nautilus from 1954, when it had been launched, until 1956. Then, Captain William R. Anderson relieved him and became the second commanding officer. And it was indeed his idea to take the Nautilus to the North Pole. And that's what the main story I want to focus on for the remainder of the episode. And any of you who read the book from Jules Verne, 2000 Leagues Under the Sea, Captain Nemo takes his submarine, also called the Nautilus, below the South Pole. At the time, Jules Verne did not know that, in fact, the South Pole is a landmass just like any other continent. In contrary, the North Pole is not a landmass. It is just a big piece of ice floating in the ocean. So you can actually pass below it. So Jules Verne just accidentally switched the poles. And... Anderson had this vision that this would be a really, really, really good idea to take the Nautilus below the ice. From one side of the polar ice pack to the other while passing underneath the North Pole. The Nautilus actually made three attempts to make it to the North Pole or from the Pacific side to the Atlantic side. The first attempt was staged in 1957 it was staged from the Atlantic side so if you look on at the map that I have left in the show notes or for you watching on YouTube it should be on the screen the Nautilus traveled from the Atlantic side in front of Greenland towards the North Pole so the idea was not to make it to the Pacific side but to make it to the North Pole and turn around. The operational orders even stated to turn around in front of the North Pole. The operational orders though were changed shortly before departure to only an estimated longitude that was to be reached. So the Nautilus did not make it to the North Pole on that first run due to navigational problems with the gyro compass and a magnetic compass is also entirely useless near the North Pole because the closer you get to the North Pole or the magnetic North Pole the more erratic a compass behaves. The crew or Anderson had known this before and had a experimental new gyro compass installed which would not start swinging erratically but would hold the pin steady. But this compass failed due to an electrical problem. So essentially, the Nautilus was headless underneath the ice, and the navigators had to work with a wildly swinging magnetic compass and a wildly swinging gyro compass, which didn't settle in. So they had to make their way back without making it to the North Pole. And in this regard, I would like to tell you a another story that happened on that first exploration because in fact the Nautilus found a Pollyanna and that is referred to in ice terms as a area in the ice pack that has very very thin ice. A lead in contradiction to that is a place where there is absolutely no ice so basically a hole in the ice with water below it and the Nautilus had a special sonar system aboard which 
sounded upwards because a normal sonar system sounds forward. These days you also have sonar arrays that arrays that go backwards, but none that go to the top because usually you are traveling in an ocean where there is nothing above you but water and you can just surface. Underneath the polar ice pack, this is of course not the case. So a special sonar system had been installed to find um, how deep the ice was above the Nautilus. And the sonar equipment showed that there was a very, very thin stretch of ice only above. So the Nautilus made a straight 90 degree ascent and during the ascent Anderson was looking through the periscope and just before breaching the top of the water the periscope went black and the reason was because the periscope hit a ice block that was sinking down. This resulted in the periscope being bended almost 45 degrees backwards, rendering it entirely useless, also tearing a hole in the side. The second periscope was also damaged because the submarine at the time only had the submarine had two periscopes. So both were useless. So the Nautilus was not only without a working compass, but also without a periscope. The Nautilus managed to make her way back out from below the ice pack and made her way to the open water, only to find that there was a raging storm. And in those conditions, they had to somehow repair the, or at least one of the periscopes because they were due to take part in a very large NATO exercise called Operation Strike Back, in which particularly Britain wanted to test their anti-submarine capabilities against a nuclear submarine, to also evaluate if they wanted to get themselves a nuclear submarine at some point in time. For this exercise, it was of course very crucial to have at least one working periscope, because they had to make their way to... Portland to start the exercise in just in a matter of weeks and they were still very far north in the Atlantic. So during a raging snowstorm they had to weld, whoever, uh, any of you who tried welding in a storm knows that that is a bad idea. So they eventually managed to get it done also while having to disregard several safety protocols regarding crash diving because usually a submarine has to always be able to dive within a few minutes or under a minute but this also includes having all the bulkheads being able to be sealed but for welding you of course need a welding hose that is connected to the power source and this hose had to be laid through several compartments and if you can't, you can't close a bulkhead on a cable that is lying there. So they had to disregard several safety protocols. A captain is allowed to lift this protocol for a certain repair operation like that one at hand. But it is never a thing taken like lightly. So after an unsuccessful first run... The Nautilus upgraded on the compass to make it more reliable and they also upgraded their sonar system. So in 1958 they started a second attempt, this time from the Pacific side. They started from Hawaii and made their way towards the Bering Strait which is the um, straight between the Soviet Union or Russia today and the US. And in between there is an island called St. Lawrence Island. They made their way there in the early summer. 
this attempt failed before they ever really reached the polar ice pack because there was too much ice in the Bering Strait and around either the west and east coast of St. Lawrence Island. So they had to abandon the attempt because they could not find their way through the ice field. At the time, the Nautilus didn't have the capability to break her way through the ice pack. Some Russian submarines would later be built so that they could actually break through ice because of course the Russian fleet or the Russian submarine fleet is always stationed there. They are always stationed in the north region of Russia so they always have to battle the ice unless it's middle to late summer. But the Nautilus did not have this capability at the time, so they had to attempt to dive underneath the ice flows. An ice flow is a block of ice that is frozen salt water. Not to be switched up with an iceberg, which is out of sweet water. And an iceberg, is that what rammed the Titanic, or the Titanic rammed the iceberg? But an ice flow is something entirely different from the water it is made of. And the ice flows, they are basically not just like super soft, they are as hard as concrete. So you imagine driving a multi-million dollar submarine into a block of concrete. So the submarine tried to dive below the ice. This also failed because of what I call the sandwich effect. And you might already think what that is. Because the sandwich effect is basically that the ice, the, the keel of the ice flows is so deep that it almost touches the seabed. So the Nautilus is sandwiched in between the seabed, which it cannot touch, and the top or the bottom of the ice keel. And in his book, Anderson describes that if a man of a normal size was standing atop the conning tower, so this tower that is set upon the rest of the hull, and stre stretched his arm up, to touch, then he would be able to touch the bottom of the ice keel. And that's insane. The same would go if a man was standing on the bottom of the sea floor. He could stretch up his hand and touch the underside of the Nautilus. So that was a very tight squeeze. And for that reason, they abandoned that attempt because they did not know if they would be in a situation where the ice keel would hit the conning tower. And if the conning tower was going to be hit by something as hard as concrete, while the submarine was traveling at a decent speed, it would tear open the conning tower and the entire submarine would flood within seconds. So they had to abandon the attempt and had to move the attempt to later summer when the ice pack would be retreated farther back so the so they could make a second run in the summer that was their third total attempt and the third attempt was successful they made their way from portland uh, from hawaii to portland by the north pole the famous northwest passage that had been searched for by multiple explorers in the centuries before. And now the Nautilus had actually accomplished that. So why was it necessary for the Nautilus to do this? I mean, it's a nice scientific feat, like landing on the moon, but it had several political motivations. Reason number one was that the Soviet Union had just launched Sputnik. 
Sputnik was a basketball-sized satellite, and for the matter of fact, the first ever satellite. It sent a peep tone back to Earth via a radio transmitter. It only survived a few days in orbit before getting back into um, the atmosphere and glowing to shards. But that meant that the Russians had a major scientific leap forward because the American rockets could just not get off the ground. The Americans tried to uh, start their or launch their rocket a few days after Sputnik made her way to space and after the launch sequence had been initiated the rocket started a few feet off the launch pad and settled back down blowing itself to bits. And that was so with several further attempts. I mean, eventually, eventually the Americans would make their way to space and be the first nation to land on the moon and so on. But that would be far, far later. So President Eisenhower, president at the time, wanted an equal scientific achievement to happen. So he wanted something to show the world, to show that America was still the number one superpower in the world, not the Soviet Union. And of course, a submarine that travels below the ice, finding the infamous Northwest Passage would be just the thing. But of course, this had to be super secret because he wanted to be the person to announce the success. That was why Operation Sunshine, the code name for the operation of the Nautilus traveling below, below the ice, was one of the most closely kept secrets at the time. Only very, very few people at the Pentagon and the White House knew about this operation. And if you read the book by Anderson, you will find some very interesting details about how secret they had to keep the operation. They actually made up a cover operation to make an excuse for being in Hawaii for so long and <laughs> that's actually quite interesting quite funny how that came along but the second and probably more important goal was to evaluate and also show the Russians that it would be possible to hide a submarine below the ice pack to fire an intermediate range missile. At the time, the Nautilus was only armed with torpedoes. But there was already a project underway that would later produce the USS George Washington that would carry intermediate range missiles. Now, these missiles would have to be fired from somewhere close to the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union had a relatively impeccable system for detecting submarines in the Barents Sea, sea that was basically their playground, was their submarines. So the submarine would have to get in range. And today we have submarines like the Ohio class submarine that can fire from anywhere in the world with their intercontinental ballistic missiles and hit Moscow or any other point on the world. The submarine that was the prospective submarine USS George Washington was going to carry intermediate range missiles or Polaris missiles as they would later be known. So you had to get relatively close to the Soviet Union. And here I want to give you a quote from Anderson out of his book. This is from a time where they surfaced um, very near to the edge of the ice pack in an, in an ice lead, so a place where there is no ice. And he says in his book, As I stood on the bridge, I had an odd thought. Had we been so equipped, we could have fired a number of guided missiles from this patch of icy water. We were close enough to the Soviet Union to do some serious damage too. The Russians would recognize that as well. So 
As this mission would later be celebrated in the entire Western world, the Russians were going to be pretty clear on the fact that the Nautilus had just passed in front of their doorstep. And they also knew, probably at least, that the Americans had a submarine in development that was going to be able to fire intermediate range missiles. So this was a tactical maneuver as well to show the Soviet Union we can fire a very, very, very big atomic bomb onto your capital. And this was something that the Soviet Union at the point at that point in time was still struggling with. They had intermediate range missiles, but they weren't far enough building nuclear submarines that could get close enough to America. Their nuclear submarine program had to actually be stomped in because their submarines were unsafe. Several submarines had problems with their reactors leading to the death of several sailors. That goes to show that the Russians probably did not have the equivalent of a Hyman Rickover who was concerned about safety in all regards. So the Soviets had a problem with firing a nuclear bomb at the Americans. They had inter intermediate range missiles and they had lots of them, but they would never be able to hit American the American continent. They would be able to make it to France from the Soviet Union. They could easily hit West Germany, but they would never be able to attack core land America. So this was a pretty big problem for the Russians. And now the Am Americans come along to show that they could, at least in a couple of years, fire at the Soviet Union from a place where it was very hard to detect submarines. Because the ice actually distorts sonar and radar. So it was going to be very hard to stop an American submarine from hiding below the ice and waiting for a, the, an encrypted order to fire at the Soviet Union. And now you might be asking, well, the Russians had bombers. Yes, the Russians did have bombers, but they were way, way, way too slow. They would have been shot down by an American fighter before they would have ever gotten close to any coastline of America. And this was also one of the reasons that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Russians at that point had developed intercontinental missiles. That's also one of the things that came out of the Sputnik Crisis, if you will. Because if you can build a rocket that sends something to space, you can also build an intercontinental ballistic missile that fires at America. But they only had very few and they were still very shaky. They weren't really ready for use in a potential World War III. So Nikita Khrushchev, who would then become the general secretary of the party in Russia, or the Soviet Union at that point, he wanted nuclear weapons stationed somewhere where he could actually fire at the United States. Cuba was, of course, a very good po point to put intermediate-range nuclear missiles because they would be able to hit almost every major city in the United States. But we will make an episode about the Cuban Missile Crisis at another point in time, um, if you are interested. By the way, if you want to send me an email with critique, ideas, or anything else, my email address for contacting me is in the show notes or in the description. So to tie things together, the Americans showed the potential to build a submarine that could attack the Soviet Union from anywhere inside their hemisphere. So that means that even if the Soviet Union would attack American core land and destroy the 
airfields with the nuclear bombers and the missile silos with the intercontinental ballistic missiles, the Americans would still have the capability to strike back with a nuclear submarine that would deliver a nuclear strike. And this is the famous second strike capability. Or as there goes a saying, if you shoot first, you die second. I think that sentence speaks for itself. And the submarines played a great role in creating this narrative for the Cold War. And in essence, they also protected world peace because one side knew that even if they were going to destroy the enemy, they were still also going to get destroyed. So that effectively prevented World War III from happening. And I am currently sitting in my recording studio and I am looking at the time frame at the bottom of my recording program and seeing that we are currently hitting north of 40 minutes. That means <laughs> that I won't be able to talk about the submarines I also wanted to tell you about at the end of today's episode. I still wanted to tell you about the USS George Washington that I mentioned previously in the episode and I still wanted to talk about the Los Angeles class submarine and the Ohio class submarine but I think I will postpone that onto a bonus episode that I will probably upload that will be probably very very short and yeah and that episode I will talk a little bit about those three submarine classes what made them special and what they did or what are they are currently doing in their function as American submarines. And if you have any ideas, as I previously mentioned, you can write me an email. The current season we are in, season one of the History Archive, is planned to go for 10 episodes. But I could also extend that if you have any idea for another episode or two. If you have an idea, then you can write me an email to noah.buyer.podcast at gmail.com and I would be very delighted if you enjoyed today's episode if you would subscribe to the channel on the podcast site where you are listening to this podcast or subscribe on YouTube and leave a like and if you want to get updates then you can subscribe my WhatsApp channel yeah, there we will find all sorts of updates to the episode release dates. I am planning to release an episode on the 14th and 28th of each month. As you have already learned this cycle, this episode is airing on the 28th and I am recording it on the 4th. So that's quite fitting. And yeah. I hope to see you in the next episode. I hope you enjoyed the episode today and I'll see you in the next couple of weeks. Bye.